uh, just a week's respite. So there's a lot going on in the region, and I'm, I'm delighted that uh, the sense of urgency is here and that we're all participating and trying to figure out different perspectives on, on uh, what's happening around us. I'm pleased that our Director General, Chaya Herskovitz, is here. And it, clearly, if there's one person in the state of Israel today, um, not supposed to embarrass people publicly, uh, Professor Enzo, I know that I'll pay for this. Please don't. I'll play for this afterwards. But really, if there's one person who can shed perspective on where we are today in the context of the last 30, 40, even 50 years, uh, it's Professor Moshe Ahrens, three-time defense minister, former foreign minister, former health minister, former ambassador to the United States. Health minister? Never. You've never been the health minister? No. <laughs> I know you were brought in as an emergency foreign minister. But you know, when, uh, when Yitzhak Mordechai was forced to resign, there was an emergency call for the mo one of the most experienced statesmen that, that anyone could imagine. So Professor Arons was called in uh, as a 911 foreign minister at that time. Defense minister. Defense minister. Oh, no, three-time defense minister. Yeah. I, mentioned I was that. called in to be defense minister. And, uh, <laughs> Um, but clearly, his role as defense minister during the 1991 war um, with Iraq should set, uh, shed some light on what has happened since and whether how prepared Israel is for events that are unfolding uh, around us, whether it's with Iran, whether it's uh, opposite uh, uh, the Palestinians, Syria, and so on. So um, I'd like to invite Professor Ahrens uh, to give us an overview of his geopolitical sense of where we are today uh, as we hear news, very disturbing news, uh, coming out of uh, Iran as to the level of, uh, of, of the threat level uh, that continues, unfortunately, to increase. Um, two things. Well, I'm gl you should be glad we didn't ask anybody to check shoes at the door uh, in light of uh, what happened yesterday in the uh, Supreme Court. And uh, also, please turn your phones back on at the end of our 35-minute or 40-minute uh, talk, and obviously we'll have our, our regular dialogue after that. Okay. Good morning. Thank you for embarrassing me. <laughs> I was asked to talk about uh, the Iranian threat to the region, to Israel to the world, and uh, some people like to think that uh, if you're in Jerusalem, you have nothing to worry about, because there's a sizable Muslim population here in, in Jerusalem, and uh, they are not there to cause massive destruction uh, in an area where many Muslims uh, might get uh, injured or killed. But uh, Bernard Lewis uh, said on a number of occasions that uh, this kind of immunity that people in Jerusalem think they may have is imaginary because he says that uh, the radical Muslims are convinced that God knows how to tell the difference between Jews and Muslims. So even if they, uh, they, will, they will go to heaven and the Jews, of course, will go somewhere else and uh, therefore people in Jerusalem are not immune. But uh, that's from a very personal perspective. Uh, I was asked to speak about the lessons that we may have learned from uh, the days of the Gulf War, that's 19 years ago, I was defense minister then, uh, regarding uh, the present danger that we face. And I hasten to say right away that essentially there are no lessons that uh, would be applicable to our present situation. Uh, the differences are very, very large. I'll point out, uh, point out to some of them. And it's uh, very difficult to say, to draw a connection or a parallel or a lesson from uh, what happened then and the policy, our policy, the American policy at the time, to what the danger that we are facing today and therefore what should uh, Israel's policy be, or what, what should uh, Israel's policy be. And uh, <clears throat> before I start, if, if any of you uh, are expecting uh, me to tell you this morning what, in my opinion, Israel should do, 
in terms of taking military action or not taking military action to forestall uh, this threat that we are facing and, and we are facing it, uh, then I'm sorry I'll have to disabuse you. I'm not going to express an opinion on that subject. Uh, I don't do that. Uh, I've been asked on a number of occasions. Uh, I don't do that. And, and the prime reason why I don't do that is that I don't feel that I have all the information uh, at my disposal. Uh, I'm not uh, a member of uh, the forums that today deal with this issue uh, in the Prime Minister's office or in the Defence Minister's office. Uh, all the necessary intelligence to, to arrive at an opinion on what should be done or what should not be done. Uh, I, don't, I don't have access to that, and so it would be foolhardy on, on my part uh, to uh, say, anything, uh, say, say anything about that. Uh, not, not even to myself. To myself, I say, I don't know enough about that. Uh, we have people who have been elected, who have the responsibility uh, for the subject. They presumably have all the information that can be uh, obtained at their disposal, and hopefully they will take the right decisions. When I think of uh, lessons that uh, may have been learned from the days of the Gulf War, uh, I would say the Iranians have learned a lesson. The Iranians have learned a lesson from uh, the destruction uh, by the Israeli Air Force in 1981 of the Osirak reactor. The Syriac reactor was destroyed by, by the Israeli Air Force, <coughs> and uh, that set back Saddam Hussein's uh, nuclear project very, very significantly. Uh, so at the time of the Gulf War, which was, uh, what, uh, nine years later, uh, our estimate was that the Iraqis really did not have any nuclear capability, that the destruction of the Osiric reactor set them back so far that they were not able, nine years later, to attain uh, any capability that would endanger us. But uh, the Assyriac nuclear reactor was really the, uh, a, a key element in the chain of uh, the Iraqi nuclear program. Uh, a single target, which if destroyed, set that program back uh, very substantially. Now, the Iranians have learned uh, their lesson. No doubt they've, they've analyzed and, and looked back on their time. And as is well known today, the Iranian uh, nuclear program is dispersed. There is no single element, no single target, which if destroyed will substantially set back the Iranian nuclear program. And much of it is deep underground so that the Iranians have done their level best to attain uh, immunity from the possibility of an aerial attack of the type that destroyed the Iraqi uh, nuclear reactor at the Syriac. And that, of course, tells you that uh, any military move, regardless of who I consider, might consider taking it, would be substantially, substantially more difficult. I don't want to say impossible again, as I told you. I don't have all the intelligent information my disposal. But uh, there's a world of difference between the problem of trying to deal with the Iranian nuclear program if somebody wants to consider a military uh, action. And, you know, uh, people in the United States and in Israel continually say uh, everything is on the table. By everything being on the table, presumably, they mean that a military action is also has not been taken off the table, has also been considered. In any case, anybody who considers a military action must know that the problem facing those considering to undertake a military action is far, far more difficult than uh, was the case in, in the case of Osirak. Uh, and uh, therefore, again, trying to draw some lessons, it really is not non applicable because of the very significant differences. I came to Washington as Israel's ambassador in 1983. The Sierra reactor, I think, was was attacked in 1982. Am I right? 1981. So, so it was a little over a year. 1981. It was a little over a year after the uh, destruction of the Sierra reactor, and uh, the atmosphere in Washington at the time. This was the Reagan administration. 
administration, I think, that is uh, correctly uh, considered to have been an administration very friendly to Israel. But uh, the atmosphere in Washington at the time was one of uh, hostility. There was uh, anger, even antagonism. Uh, the administration thought that the uh, Israeli action was uh, ill-conceived, uh, was a mistake, could only cause problems rather than solve problems. And there was talk in Washington a year and a half later, when I arrived, of actually imposing sanctions against Israel uh, as a uh, reaction to this unilateral action by the Israeli Air Force against the Osir reactor. And I think it was all, not more than maybe a year or two later that the view on uh, that particular operation changed in Washington, I think probably throughout the world and change completely. It's difficult to envisage the United States during the Gulf War, right, in 1990, some 19 years uh, uh, ago, uh, the uh, Amer American operation during the Gulf War, Desert Storm, being undertaken if the uh, Iraqi nuclear reactor had still existed and the Iraqi nuclear program had continued from 1981 onwards, if that program had not been so seriously set back by the Israeli activity. And I think that is generally recognized today. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, David Ivry, General Ivry, who was the uh, commander of the Israeli Air Force at the time of the uh, Syriac uh, uh, operation, has a uh, photograph in his office, used to have anyway a photograph in his office, that was given to him by Dick Cheney, who was the American Defense Secretary during the uh, Gulf War. Uh, of the destroyed reactor and it was given to him with the compliments of the American Secretary of Defense and it was some indication of the appreciation that I think today is felt by most if not by all about the very important positive aspects of that uh, particular operation. <laughs> so with time people's views change and what turned out to be uh, a feeling of uh, antagonism and even hostility changed to a feeling of very strong appreciation for what was done to the benefit of everybody, certainly the benefit of the Western world, and of course to Israel's benefit. So when we look back at uh, Washington in 1983, still under the uh, impression of the Osirak operation, and Washington today then one of the big difference is that whereas in 1981 there was not in Washington, and I think probably not in the Western world generally, a great awareness of the danger of the nuclear activity in Iraq. Uh, the, the danger that was posed by that nuclear activity to the United States, to the world, the Western world in particular, to Israel, uh, at the present time, in the year 2010, one thing I think we can say with certainty that uh, today there is in the United States, I think probably in all of the Western world, not including say Russia and China, which is I guess generally not considered to be a part of the Western world, there is in all of the Western world a very real acute awareness of the danger that uh, the Iranian nuclear uh, activity, uh, clearly designed to achieve nuclear military capability, that the danger that that poses to the world, not only to Israel, the danger that that poses to the world. And uh, in that sense, that change that uh, uh, we could see during the past maybe five, six, uh, six years, am I doing something wrong? Yeah. Uh, it also represents, of course, a, uh, a move, an improvement, as far as Israel is concerned. Because if you look back, say, 10 years ago, when we were already acutely aware of the Iranian nuclear effort and the, da the danger that that poses, 
in my last tenure as defense minister, I remember talk to that, talking about that to the Russian ambassador <clears throat> and telling them that the Russians were, if not directly, then indirectly, through their uh, participation in the Bashir nuclear reactor, helping the Iranians move along the, uh, the, nuclear, uh, uh, the nuclear route. Uh, at that time, there was not general awareness. Israel was pretty much alone, pretty much isolated, when it, as regards the concern that it had for the uh, danger that the nuclear program in Iraq uh, posed. And in that sense, I would say there's been a big step forward that today the world, the leader of the world, the United States, the leader of the, of the Western community of nations, is acutely aware that this is dangerous, not only to Israel, this is dangerous to the world. So it took some time before that uh, awareness arose, before the danger became apparent. But of course, during that time, the Iranians have advanced their nuclear program and advanced it very, very considerably. And it may be, it may be, that uh, some years ago, at an earlier stage of the Iranian nuclear program, that maybe there was a single target, or maybe two targets, which if destroyed, could have set up, set back that program very substantially, and things were not yet all buried underground. In the years that have passed, the Iranians have advanced very significantly, not only in the, in the nuclear uh, direction, but also in, uh, in terms of uh, achieving for themselves immunity from such attack by the way that they have dispersed the activity and put much of it uh, underground and very deep underground. Well, what were, what were the problems that we faced uh, uh, during the Gulf War? The problem that Israel faced were the uh, existence in Iraq of uh, Scud missiles. Scud is essentially a somewhat upgraded German V-2 rocket. I think the Scud uh, missiles that were in uh, Iraq's uh, inventory at the time uh, came from the Soviet Union. They had a range of 500 kilometers, and the distance from western Iraq to Israel is about 500 kilometers. The center of Israel is about 500 kilometers. So we knew that the Iraqis had the capability of hitting Israel with uh, Scud missiles. We did not, we, did, we were not of the opinion that the Iraqis had nuclear capability, so we were not concerned about being hit by nuclear weapons. We knew they had uh, conventional explosive capability, warheads for the Scud missiles, and our estimate was that they also had chemical warheads that could be put, could be put onto the uh, it could be the warheads for these uh, for these missiles and so uh, the first question that arose in anticipation of that kind of a danger was uh, that uh, whether we could whether the Iraqis would be deterred from firing from launching these missiles against uh, against Israel I, I met with uh, President Mubarak uh, not long, shortly before the Gulf War, and I told him about our concern regarding the uh, Scud missiles in Iraq that might be launched against Israel, and uh, he was of the opinion that we had nothing to be concerned about. He was of the opinion that they would not dare to use these missiles, fire these missiles against Israel. Well, it turned out that he was wrong, and, and many people would thought that, in effect, Israel had a deterrent, and that Saddam Hussein would be deterred from firing these missiles against Israel. It turned out to be wrong. He fired, uh, I think it was 39 missiles against Israel during the Gulf War. Uh, fortunately, only six landed in populated areas one of them not far from my house in Savion. Uh, there was considerable property damage 
Only one civilian uh, was killed. But most of Israel's population went around with gas masks and uh, took shelter in sealed rooms or in, or in underground shelters, wherever they had access to them, uh, during those five weeks that were not pleasant weeks for Israel, and uh, where we, every day or so, uh, found ourselves under the under fire from these uh, from these missiles. The Iraqis did not use chemical warheads during the Gulf War, and uh, we can only assume, since we know that they had chemical warheads uh, at the time, we can only assume that they were deterred from doing so. Whether they, they were deterred by what they thought might be an Israeli response, or maybe equally, or from their point of view, maybe more probably what might be the American response, because this was during the Gulf War, and uh, the United States and its allies, Britain, were actively engaged in warfare against the Iraqis, so that's something that they would have to take into consideration, and yet they knew that there was very close coordination, collaboration between the United States and Israel, that there might be an American response that uh, they, they might not welcome. The fact of the matter is that they did not uh, use chemical weapons, although they had them uh, at the time. <clears throat> now, uh, we had no reason, uh, as uh, the, the uh, countdown began uh, for the Gulf War, for the, for the American uh, invasion of Kuwait and, and Iraq, uh, as the countdown began, we had really no reason to, or little reason, to assume that the Iraqis were not going to fire uh, Scud missiles against Israel, for the simple reason that the Iraqi uh, foreign minister, who remembers his name, Christian Iraqi, Tariq Aziz, Tariq Aziz, Tariq Aziz, Tariq Aziz uh, said so quite openly. Uh, you may remember he met with uh, Jim Baker, uh, in Geneva, uh, shortly before the United States launched uh, the military operation, and uh, it was a last-minute attempt to see if somehow the, the situation could be resolved without military action. And he at that time said to newspaper reporters, if we are attacked, we will fire missiles against Israel. And uh, he was as good as his word. I think he's uh, up on trial now, or will be up on trial shortly. Uh, not necessarily for, the, for that statement, but for some, for some other bad things that he did. So, uh, we, we, we knew, we had every reason to believe they were coming, and uh, the precautions we took, as you know, is the sealed rooms, the distribution of gas masks, and very unpleasant things for, for a population. I think those of you who were here at the time may remember the very unusual sight of Israelis and little children walking around with these little brown boxes uh, at their side that contained the, the gas, uh, gas mask that, that they were prepared to put on uh, their faces the minute the alarm was sounded. And whenever an alarm was sounded, and that was quite often, it was almost every day during these, uh, this five-day period, uh, either pe people ran to shelters, ran to their sealed rooms, put on their gas masks, went, went through the whole routine, even though, as I said, the uh, chemicals were not used. Now, uh, we were not in a position to intercept these Scud missiles. I mentioned that the, the Scuds are an upgraded, somewhat upgraded version of the German V-2 rockets uh, from World War II. You probably know from your knowledge of history that towards the end of World War II, the Germans fired these V-2 rockets against uh, uh, against London, against, against Britain, causing consi very considerable damage. And uh, there was no way of intercepting them. And for many years thereafter, aeronautical engineers like myself <coughs> said that there's no way of intercepting a ballistic missile. That that's like hitting a bullet with a bullet. That is beyond our technological capability. We know how to shoot down airplanes, but we don't know how to shoot down a ballistic missile that comes at us at uh, high supersonic speeds. Now during the uh, Gulf War, during the period when Israel uh, was subjected 
to the Arrow missile attack, we were already in the process of developing a missile that uh, was going to have, was, was designed to have the capability of uh, intercepting the, uh, the uh, Scud rockets. And uh, the reason that this had become possible was because there were advances, primarily in computer technology and in radar technology, that now made what was considered to be mission impossible look like maybe it was going to be possible. And uh, that development was started some years before the Gulf War. Uh, it was partially funded by the United States as part of <coughs> what Reagan called the Star Wars Initiative, when the United States launched a very large program to develop uh, anti-missile missiles. And it turned out to be, I think, the first successful anti-missile missile, the first anti-missile missile uh, to become operational uh, here in Israel, the Arrow, what we call, we call the Chetz. But it was in development at the time of the Gulf War. It was not available at that time. Uh, so it would be wrong to say that one of the lessons of the Gulf War and uh, the missiles that were launched against Israel was that we would develop a, a missile interceptor. That was something that we were already doing prior to that time but it was not available. It was far from operational status at the time of the, uh, of the Gulf War. Today we have an interceptor, the Arrow system. It not only can intercept uh, missiles that come at us from 500 kilometer range, it can intercept missiles that come at us from 1,000 kilometer range, even beyond 1,000 kilometer range. It has the capability of intercepting missiles that would be launched from Iran, uh, there has been some discussion in Israel, I suppose also abroad, as to whether this is a, uh, a positive, uh, a wise development, involves considerable expenditure of funds. Uh, a significant portion of it comes from the United States, continues to come from the United States, both for development and also for uh, the production of the missiles. Uh, some aero missiles are now being produced in the United States by the Boeing Company, as part of a contract that was signed between Israel Aircraft Industries and, uh, and the Boeing Company. And uh, some people have said and continue to say that this is really not very smart. The missile that we intend to intercept is a relatively cheap weapon that may cost maybe a few thousand dollars, and we are launching against it a very, very expensive weapon so in terms of the uh, cost ratio, this at first sight really does not seem very wise. But uh, when you think of the damage that might be caused by the missile that has been launched against you, which, uh, which will go way beyond not only the cost of, this, of the missile that has been launched, but also way beyond maybe the cost, the, the money that you have invested in the development of an anti-missile system, you begin to see that maybe this was a really a very smart move. And also because of the dilemma that it poses to anybody who decides to launch missiles against Israel, especially if you were to think in terms of a missile that had a nuclear warhead, the dilemma that is posed for him with the knowledge that that missile may very well be intercepted. And so he would be caught red-handed launching a nuclear missile that doesn't reach its target, but nevertheless thereafter receiving the response that he can expect and that is predictable for having committed this deed, he might very well decide that he would rather not take that chance and not launch, launch the missile. Uh, there are many ways of trying to fool a missile interceptor by the use of decoys, by the use of maneuvering re-entry re -entry vehicles that would try to escape the, the interceptor. But for every measure, there's a countermeasure, and uh, the people who are developing the arrow, of course, are taking all that into consideration, and I think that we have a, a pretty effective system. Uh, nobody will go so far as to say it's 100% effective, and that, of course, immediately raises the counter-argument that says, well, if they launch 100 missiles and we intercept 99, but one of them comes through and it has a nuclear warhead on it, so what have you done? But uh, 
as I said, the dilemma facing the person uh, deciding to launch the missile, and usually a hundred missiles with that kind of warheads would not be available to them anyway, uh, really make it pretty clear that the development of a uh, missile interceptor, a very challenging technological project, is a very wise move, and uh, we in Israel have been successful in doing so. The Americans, in the meantime, have also developed uh, an anti-missile anti system, the FAB, and so I think we, we have entered the era of missile interception, which changes, in many ways, changes the rules of the game of attack uh, by missiles. As an aside, I might say, as you probably all know, that Israel is uh, very close to fielding a uh, missile interceptor, inter interceptor system against short-range missiles. Right, the uh, Kipat Barzel, I don't know what they call it in English, Iron Dome, Iron Dome. The, the, the Iron Dome system. And again, you don't have to be a physicist or an aeronautical engineer to realize that the shorter the range of the missile that's being launched against you, the more difficult it is to intercept because you simply have less time available, less, less flight time on the trajectory, less time to try to uh, locate the missile with, uh, with the search radar, less time to uh, determine just where it is and what its trajectory is, and then launch the missile that would intercept it. So the, uh, uh, the, the Iron Dome system, which is intended to intercept missiles of short range, of tens of kilometers, maybe even 10, 10 kilometer range, is a very significant, substantial technological achievement. Some people might wonder whether it is a worthwhile investment or very significant funds that are needed uh, to attain this objective because the shorter the range, of course, the more obvious the alternate option is of simply going on the ground and reaching the launch sites rather than trying to uh, hit the missile in midair, simply going, uh, sending your, your troops into the area where the missiles are uh, where the missiles are being launched. But we've done it and we've, uh, it is really a very significant technological achievement, I think not so far not achieved uh, anywhere, anywhere else in the world. And they will be fielded and it will change somewhat, I think only somewhat, the uh, problems that Israel faces in the south from Hamas in Gaza and uh, probably also in the north from Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. Now, uh, one, one thing that uh, characterized the problems that we faced uh, during the Gulf War was a very noisy, noisy in quotation marks, communication channel with the United States. The physical contact was good. Uh, I had a... Uh, channel dedicated to communicating with the American Secretary of Defense, uh, uh, Dick Cheney. Uh, we spoke at least every day, sometimes two or three times a day. Uh, I went to Washington, I met with uh, President Bush, uh, I met with, with the American Chief of Staff. So uh, we had contact, we had a visit by an American delegation. Uh, Eagleberger, who was Secretary of State at the time, and Wolfowitz, uh, who worked with him, <coughs> prior to the initiation of uh, Desert, uh, Desert Storm, because the Americans were very concerned that even before they began a military operation, Israel might take preemptive action. And they were very eager, you may remember, that Israel <coughs> not in any way get involved in the operation because they had built a coalition with Arab countries, Egypt, Syria, Saudi Arabia. They were, they were operating out of Saudi Arabia, and they were afraid that if Israel openly got involved in the operation, that coalition might fall apart, and that that might uh, endanger the very uh, multi-operation that they were, uh, they were prepared to uh, begin. So uh, they arrived here before, a few days before, and uh, they asked, they asked uh, that we not undertake any preemptive action, that we let them handle, uh, handle the situation. And uh, what they said was, one, they expect that within 48 hours, the United States Air Force would eliminate the launch capability of the Iraqis. 
uh, to remind you that the scouts were being launched from mobile launchers, so it was clear that that was not going to be an easy task to uh, locate a launcher that was moving, set up, launched, and then disappeared into some hiding place, but they were confident that they were going to be able to do it, and alternately, they said if, they, if it turned out that they could not do it within 48 hours, then, then Israel would be free to take whatever action Israel considered to be appropriate. And it was under these assumptions that uh, as a storm began, uh, Israel did not uh, take any preemptive action. Uh, uh, when the first cuts fell, we waited for the United States to take care of that problem, and it turned out that uh, the problem of uh, hitting mobile launchers turned out to be far more difficult than the United States Air Force had envisaged. As a matter of fact, during the five weeks of the Gulf War, although there had been intensive aerial activity that was directed at uh, hitting the Scud launchers, not a single Scud launcher was hit or immobilized during the Gulf War. <clears throat> uh, hitting moving targets that appear only for a very short period of time, for a number of minutes, and then disappear is, is very, very difficult. I would say even, even to this day, very, very difficult. So it turned out that uh, what the United States had anticipated they would be able to do, and thus remove the danger from Israel of being hit by, um, by uh, missiles from Iraq, was something that they could not do. <coughs> The fact that not a single uh, Scud missile launcher was hit uh, during those five weeks became fully apparent only after the war. During the war there was some uh, uh, information that came out that here and there a Scud launcher had been hit, but the, the full count we could make only after the war, and then it turned out that not a single launcher had been hit. Uh, well, then it appeared that the United States was very eager even at that point that Israel not intervene in any way. And so, in effect, the uh, position that had been uh, uh, stated, that if within 48 hours that threat could not be eliminated, the United States would feel that Israel was free to take action, that position changed, and uh, even after 48 hours, and after 72 hours, uh, the United States, President Bush called uh, Yitzhak Shamir, the Prime Minister, Jim Baker called me, uh, asking, insisting that uh, we not take any action, that we don't in, do not in any way spoil, in quotation marks, the operation that was underway, uh, uh, for which uh, President Bush, the father, had organized a uh, coalition that included the Arab states. And then came uh, the Patriots. Now, the Patriot is a was an anti-aircraft missile that at the time was advertised as also having anti-missile capability. Uh, we had uh, put in an order for Patriots considerably before the Gulf War as an anti-aircraft missile. It was probably the most advanced anti-aircraft missile around at the time. But uh, when the Gulf War started, uh, the United States insisted that the Patriot, which had been, uh, which was operating out of Saudi Arabia, was effective in destroying Scud missiles that were launched against Saudi Arabia. And uh, so the United States urged us to uh, also uh, to accept uh, Patriot missiles and were prepared to send Patriot missiles to Israel with Patriot crews because our crews had not yet been, not yet been trained. I was faced with a rather touchy question of whether we should accept uh, American crews that would accompany the Patriot missiles and operate the Patriot <coughs> missiles, something that I didn't feel fully comfortable with, but uh, under the impression that they were effective in intercepting uh, Scud missiles, I felt I had no choice. I said, okay, thank you, we will accept uh, the Patriot missiles with the American crews, and we had Patriot missiles with American crews in Israel at the time. Uh, but as it turned out, 
the Patriot missiles, at least the ones that were uh, in Israel, did not succeed in intercepting a single, single Scud missile. So for a while here was the impression that we had, there was a system, there was a system that was effective, that we could now intercept the Scud missiles, but it turned out that uh, they were not effective. They're not capable. Today there's a more advanced version of the Patriot, and it is said that it has limited capability for intercepting uh, ballistic missiles, and I'm prepared to assume that that is the case, but that was not the case at the time. So, uh, we got into uh, conversations, uh, to some, some extent even arguments, about an Israeli response to the Scud missiles that were falling in Israel. And I remind you again, this was a five-week period, so there was plenty of time to do some thinking and, and talking and uh, discussing and even arguing, and even for me to take a trip to Washington to tell uh, President Bush that uh, we could not uh, reconcile ourselves with the continuing situation of these missiles falling in Israel and that uh, we had to take action. Now, what, what kind of action? Although the initial feeling in Israel was that uh, maybe we should get the Israeli Air Force to respond. But you really didn't have to do uh, and to think very seriously second or third thoughts to realize that when the United States and its British allies were uh, employing an armada of air aircraft that were flying out of Saudi Arabia and off uh, uh, aircraft carriers in the Persian Gulf, uh, plastering Iraq day and night, that whatever the Israeli Air Force would be able to do it at a very considerable range for us, right, say a thousand kilometers to get to Baghdad, was really not, go not going to be substantial, and might not even be significant might not even be felt, might be more like a uh, drop in the ocean, and that that would not be very sensible, would not make much sense, and could not be carried out unless there was close coordination <coughs> with the United States, so that we don't get Israeli aircraft and American aircraft, or British aircraft, shooting at each other. And the, the United States was not eager to uh, organized that kind of coordination for obvious reasons. They were not interested in us in any way participating in the fighting during, during the Gulf War. So, as I said, it didn't seem to make any sense for us uh, to use our Air Force under these circumstances uh, in terms of neutralizing the launching of the Scuds. It became clear very quickly that the only way that this could be done if it could be done, would be by ground troops, by ground troops searching for the launches, for the places where the launches were being hidden, for the places from which the missiles were being launched, and taking action on the ground. Well, that's no simple operation, right? A thousand kilometers from, from Israel would involve landing ground troops in western Iraq, and uh, for them to take the necessary action. Uh, we prepared that kind of an operation. Uh, Nehemiah Tamari, who was a general in the Israeli army, was a man that was scheduled to lead that operation. Uh, he fell in an accident some years later. Uh, and I went to Washington to tell uh, President Bush that uh, we had no choice, that we would have to take uh, that kind of an action. They didn't like it, they finally accepted it. But before we were able to launch uh, this operation, uh, the Americans declared a ceasefire and the war was over. We could put the gas masks away and we never got to uh, carry out that, that ground operation uh, on which there were, by the way, differences of opinion in Israel. Some people thought that this was very dangerous and maybe even foolhardy. Uh, some people to this day say that uh, Isaac Shamir, our Prime Minister, who was not opposed, but he was not enthusiastic about it, maybe uh, demonstrated uh, great wisdom, great, great diplomatic wisdom, in, in not uh, pushing for that kind of an operation. But in any fact, the, the changes that took place in Iraq uh, prevent, prevented the, the, the operation taking place. 
Well, a few words about, about Iran. Uh, you only have to look at a map to realize that Iran, Iran is much farther from Israel than Iraq. Iran is a country that is uh, far stronger than Iraq was at the time. It's a bigger country, it's a strong country, it's a richer country, and as I've already pointed out, its nuclear facilities are dispersed, dispersed and, and underground. In parallel, I, I guess I would have to say that the Israeli Air Force is today uh, considerably more powerful than it was at the time, and it is capable of undertaking long-range missions than the ones that it could undertake uh, at the time, 19 years later. Iran has allies, unlike Iraq, Hezbollah in Lebanon, Hamas in, in Gaza. Uh, if there were to be any kind of military engagement, it is clear that uh, the Iranian, Iran itself, of course, would be engaged but also its allies, uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon and Hamas in, uh, in Gaza, would most likely also, also begin military operations against Israel. Uh, on the other hand, especially lately, there's a feeling that uh, the Iranian regime is not completely stable. I have no idea, I'm not an Iranian expert, I'm not in a position to tell you uh, what its uh, life expectancy is, but it clearly is not, uh, does not have an ind indefinite life expectancy. So I don't know whether it's on its last legs, but it's a sort of situation where maybe any day, any month, any year, we might find that uh, this, the regime there has been overturned and the whole picture might very well have changed. That, of course, should enter any calculations about the kind of action that might or, may, or might not be taken. And uh, so a lot of accent is being put uh, during the past year, especially during the past months, on sanctions. I just read this morning a headline that uh, President Obama, maybe in the uh, State of the Nation address, said that uh, time has run out and uh, the Iranians will be punished for the fact that they are continuing with their nuclear power program. So there's a lot of activity in, in the sanctions area. There's some difference of opinion about the sanctions. Uh, I don't know enough about that either, whether they could or could not be effective, uh, whether unless the uh, Chinese and Russians participate in the sanctions, uh, they would be meaningful or not meaningful. Clearly, uh, more economic pressure could be applied uh, to the Iranians uh, if the United States decided to do so. Here I just read, as you read, uh, yesterday Siemens decided to pull out of a, uh, a multi-billion contract in, in Iran. So there is a lot that could be done. Just how effective that is likely to be, uh, I think is probably anybody's guess. But what we do know is that uh, the Iranian nuclear program is considered to be by most in the world and by most of the leaders of the countries of the world, a world problem, not just an Israeli problem, a world problem, and I assume that it will be treated as such uh, in the months to come. Thank you. In a couple of minutes uh, for some questions, sir, just please, and identify yourself. We have a mic, a roving mic. Yeah, in the transcript. Professor Aaron Zahn, Ariel Sullivan, on the media line. I, I want to ask you... Welcome back to Israel. <laughs> Thank you, I never left. Uh, I was in Stanford, you're right. Um, I want to ask you a question about the deterrence, Israel's deterrence today, vis-a-vis -vis Iran, compared to what happened in 1991. <clears throat> in retrospect, do you think the fact that Israel did not retaliate physically against Iraq had an impact on the deterrent capability of Israel today? Recording. Are you recording from there? Yeah. Okay, so better than better than from there. Well, deterrence is a somewhat ill-defined uh, term.
and it's not at all easy to uh, rationalize and explain and to calculate, if you can calculate that sort of thing, when deterrence works and when it doesn't work, and what you have to do for deterrence uh, to work. I started by uh, quoting uh, Bernard Lewis, you know, uh, you know, as a tongue, tongue in cheek, as said, uh, denigrating whatever deterrence people thought uh, might exist, or whatever, whatever immunity people might think existed. Uh, in, in the area of Jerusalem, where there's a big, uh, big Muslim population. Uh, and at various times in Israel's recent history, it has been said Israel has lost its deterrence uh, capability by doing this or that, or by not doing this or that. And I think a lot of this goes back, if we, if we want to look back at uh, Israel's uh, history during its uh, 61 years of existence, uh, to the Yom Kippur War, my opinion, to the results of the Yom Kippur War, which in its wake brought the Israeli-Egyptian uh, Peace Treaty, and I think uh, created uh, the impression that after the Yom Kippur War, and after what I consider to have been uh, Israel's uh, very substantial victory in the Yom Kippur War, a war that began under very bad initial conditions, with Israel being surprised caught by surprise in the north and south, but then three weeks later, the Israeli army is standing 101 kilometers from Cairo, and within an artillery range of Damascus, the, which I think brought them to a conclusion that there was no point in trying to defeat Israel on the battlefield by conventional armed forces. And I think that you could translate by saying that Israel achieved deterrent capability. If whatever potential enemies you might have come to the conclusion that there's no point in practicing aggression against Israel by using tanks and aircraft, uh, then, okay, then, then you, have to, you have deterred them from doing so. Uh, and uh, I think ever since then we have asked ourselves, well, does this deterrent, do we still have that deterrent capability? And clearly we don't have the turn, that deterrent capability against the terrorists, because there have been acts of terror against Israel, and the terrorists have not been deterred, and this raises the question, about whether you can at all deter terrorists. It's one thing to deter a nation state that has an infrastructure, that uh, has a power base, that has a leadership that doesn't want to lose its power, and it's quite another thing to try to create a situation where terrorists will say, we want to think twice or we don't want to even consider taking terrorist action because of the response that might be expected. Well, we've not been able to deter uh, terrorists. We've, been, we've been able to defeat terrorists. We haven't that that wave of terror that struck Israel uh, in the year 2000, 2002, in the wake of the uh, of the Camp David uh, negotiations by El Barak, uh, that has been subdued. But I, I wouldn't say it's been deterred. I think it's been subdued, uh, subdued militarily. And terrorism is very very difficult to deter. So when uh, during the Gulf War Israel was hit and in fact did not respond. There were many in Israel who said that this is uh, a blow at Israel's deterrent capability. I was for a response and I gave instructions to uh, prepare a military operation, as I said, and, and a very difficult one and dangerous one uh, in western Iraq, but mainly because I thought it would be wrong for Israel for the first time in its history to be hit without responding. In principle, wrong. In principle, I thought that would be wrong. Wrong for Israeli morale. Wrong for whatever message it sends to Israel's enemies. Uh, it's not part of the Jewish biblical doctrine. We know that. When I was said, you know, the fact that you did a response and some of the uh, questions were directed at me as defense minister. Here was a blow to Israel's deterrent capability. I don't think that this is really the case. Whatever deterrence we had, if the Iraqis did not use chemical weapons against Israel, it was not because of whatever concern they had or did not have of an Israeli military operation. It was because of other concerns. And these other concerns, I think, exist to this very day. Uh, we have, in the meantime, as I pointed out, in military operations against uh, uh, terrorists in Judea and Samaria, 
in Gaza in, in the recent uh, in the recent operation uh, gas led uh, taken taken actions against terrorist activity uh, I, I don't think in answer to your question that the fact that we did not respond uh, during the Gulf War that was many years ago now has uh, left a permanent imprint <coughs> or damaged permanently Israel's deterrent capability Sergio I'm Sergio Plan from the Romanian News Agency. Professor Harris, I think you you spoke um, in a very appreciative uh, terms about the capabilities of the Arrow uh, anti-ballistic uh, system. But I would like to remind you that maybe during your time in office uh, there was another anti-ballistic system being developed, the Nautilus. And many I heard many commanders of the Israeli Air Force saying that it was superior in a way uh, to the Arrow, and um, uh, it made it unnecessary having uh, large supplies of missiles because a um, um, uh, laser beam was more economical than a missile. So why, what caused the, um, the Nautilus uh, system to be scrapped? The, the Nautilus system, uh, which is a laser system, was never a competitor to the Arrow. And uh, the Nautilus system, to the extent to which it can intercept uh, missiles coming at Israel, is not capable of intercepting missiles that come from a long range. The Nautilus system, when so considered, was considered a competitor to the Iron Dome, to a system that would intercept short-range missiles. And here the decision taken by the Israeli Defense Establishment, considerably after I uh, left the position of the Defense Minister, was to prefer the Iron Dome concept. There was a physical intercept, a, a uh, hit to kill to the Nautilus system, which is a very uh, cumbersome, uh, large, a uh, difficult system whose, whose uh, uh, development had never been completed. I'm not in a position to judge whether that decision was correct or not. It was taken some, some years ago. As I said, the Nautilus was not a competitor. Never was and is not today a competitor to the Arrow. Professor Ben Knight from uh, ABC Australia. <coughs> I just wonder if you think that the uh, the window for a military attack on Iran, either by Israel or the U.S., has in fact passed. Well, as I said, I'm not going to express an opinion on the subject because I have not formulated an opinion, because I don't have all the information uh, uh, at my disposal. Uh, my own guess would be that, uh, no, nothing's passed, uh, but uh, it's obviously not something that's easy to do. Please, um, oh, please, Jean. Jean Claude. Jean Michel. Jean Michel. Uh, 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 what do you think the European powers could or should do relating to the Iranian situation today, besides the eventual uh, political or economical sanctions? Well, I think the only part of the question that I can address, in light of what I've already said, is the, the economic sanctions. And I think there the European powers can, can still do a great deal. I understand that uh, Siemens' decision to uh, abrogate his contracts in Iran is only part of a very large economic relationship that exists between German companies and, and Iran. But I think probably not, not only German companies, right? Lots of other European companies have dealings with Iran. <clears throat> Laszlo Kolanyi from the Hungarian Embassy. Uh, let me ask a question not related to Iran, uh, based on uh, that I'm reading regularly your uh, opinion column in uh, Haaretz, so you express your opinion on a number of issues there. Um, it's related to the Palestinian-Israeli talks. Recently there was published a map uh, regarding uh, the Olmert offer, and um, my question would be that uh, um, what is your opinion regarding the concept that is reflected there? So it seems that it is more reflecting uh, to incorporate as many settlements as possible and not as much as uh, defensible borders, which is uh, usually another issue. And sometimes these conflict uh, to each other, these requirements. Uh, what is your opinion on, on that? <coughs> Well, uh, 
if you read my most recent article in, in Haaretz, not published in Hungarian, I don't think. Uh, well, I'm reading Haaretz in English. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then uh, you, you probably know that I have uh, very serious doubts about the efficacy of the negotiations, quite regardless of the results that uh, may eventually uh, transpire. Uh, there was a time when in Israel it was said that there's nobody to talk to, talking about the Palestinians, nobody to talk to. El Barak said that. He was the Prime Minister who made very far-reaching offer of concessions in the discussions at Camp David in the year 2000, I think, and uh, followed by some discussions at uh, Taba. And uh, he said, when these concessions were turned down by Yasser Arafat, he said, that made it clear that there's nobody to talk to. And by that he meant that there was nobody on the other side that was prepared to even accept what Israelis might consider it to be the maximum, maximum concessions that Israel could make. So there's nobody to talk to. Well, Yasser Arafat's not there anymore. And it is true that uh, Mahmoud Abbas, right, Abu Mazen, speaks entirely differently than Yasser Arafat does. And uh, very clearly, and you might say even courageously, says to the Palestinians, that terrorism is not going to produce any positive results for the Palestinians. That that is not a weapon that they should use. Yasser Arafat never said that. So you might say, now that uh, Abu Mazen is the, the interlocutor, so there is somebody to talk to. That presumably might be able to reach an, an agreement. But uh, whoever says that, and then I think we would like to, we would like to be able to say that. A little bit of wishful, wishful thinking simply regards the reality on the ground, namely that today there is not one Palestinian entity, there are two Palestinian entities. There's one in Gaza and there's one in Judea and Samaria. The one in Gaza, ruled by Hamas, does not want, does not want to talk to Israel. The question is not if there's anybody to talk, anybody to, talk to there or not. They don't want to talk to Israel. They don't want to recognize Israel's existence, they don't want to negotiate with Israel. So if we're talking, we're talking to, in terms of population, I, I guess only one half of the Palestinians. Right? I guess the number of Palestinians living in Judea and Samaria and the ones living in Gaza is about the same, right? Maybe one, one well, there's about 1.45 million, 1.5 million in the West Bank and about 1.2 in Gaza. Well, well, close, close to 50, close to 50, 50. Uh, but in addition, it has to be said that uh, Mahmoud Abbas is not really in charge in Judea and Samaria. Right? His position there is far from being stable, doesn't really control things, and many people think that if the Israeli army were to move out, that would be the end of Mahmoud Abbas's position in the Palestinian Authority. So here you're talking to say, half the Palestinians, or 60 percent of the Palestinians, and you're talking to a man who's not really in charge, who is not going to be able to implement any agreements that he might reach, and probably is not even in a position to agree to anything that would be agreeable to Israel. So therefore I, I think that the whole uh, the negotiations, the ones that were carried out by Ehud Olmert, and the ones that our pri present Prime Minister is pleading to renew, are really surrealistic, and are not likely to lead anywhere. So in that sense, whereas when Yasser Arafat was in charge, there was nobody to talk to, because he didn't really want to uh, reach an agreement with us, uh, at the present time there is nobody to talk to because there's Hamas, there's Abu Mazen, he's not fully in charge. Uh, it may, it may, uh, it may create some favorable impressions if these negotiation, negotiations ever are renewed, I don't know if they will be, but my feeling is that they're not going to lead anywhere. So that's a very unfortunate conclusion, but I think that to be realistic you can't escape that conclusion. I have two more questions, uh, David Essing, and then... Uh, Professor Arons, I'd like to ask you about the um, outcome of cast lead when it comes to deterrence. Because on the other hand, Israel's paying now in PR and Goldstone and, and so forth. And I, I wonder what your thoughts are about this, about 
Israel is not participating in the Goldstone uh, inquiry, and whether the decision not to let the press cover the war from the Israeli side has backfired. Uh, and maybe that we have something to learn from the Americans in Iraq, where they had the idea of, Im of embedded reporters with army units who covered the story and presented the position of the Americans in Iraq uh, one way or the other. But maybe Israel should also follow, also follow suit and not keep the media totally out of any kind of military operation. Well, in general, I, ten I tend to agree with, uh, with your view that uh, you should give the media access as much as you can, even during military operations. True, the Americans have done that uh, in Iraq, and uh, maybe we should have done it in Gaza. And I, again, I'm not acquainted with the details and just how that decision was reached and all the arguments that were put forth for not let, giving the media full access. But uh, it may be that on second thought, if we ever have to reach that kind of situation again, which is not unlikely right, in this part of the world, that uh, maybe things will be handled differently. But <clears throat> I would say the, the facts really are uh, so clear that I'm not objective in an Israeli, in a former defense minister, but the facts in my view are so clear that there's really no room for argument. The Hamas were firing rockets against Israeli civilians. I saw today that Hamas' response to the Goldstone report in the papers was that actually the rocks were directed against military targets, but by error they have to hit civilians. Well, anybody wants to, maybe Goldstone believes that. You know? Maybe the people on the Goldstone panel believe that. But I think nobody else believes that. Those Qassam rockets are so inaccurate that anybody who fires them knows that they're not going to hit any point target. And they're not going to hit any military target. They were fired against the road. And Tarot was not a military target, it's a town. Uh -huh. clear, clearly fired against civilians. So uh, the Hamas directed its fire against civilians. It's another form of terrorism, by the way. I mean, uh, the terrorism that we've seen here in recent years has been, on the one hand, uh, terrorism by suicide bombers, a very effective means of terrorism. Right? It hits point targets, the suicide bomber comes into the place, being of course civilians, right? Into the restaurant or into the movie or into the uh, place where they're celebrating the, uh, the Passover Seder, blows himself up, can't miss. You're going to hit every time, right? And uh, now that we have subdued that, the alternate course of action that's been taken is ballistic missiles. That's easy, right? Because you fire from a distance. And as long as the Israeli army is not present, in the areas where the launches are being, uh, taking place, you, you get away scot-free. But obviously it's also a weapon used against civilians. It's not a, it's not a weapon against, uh, uh, against military targets. So Goldstone knew, knew that, and everybody knew that, and uh, that these uh, uh, missiles were being fired from areas of heavily concentrated civilian population. Is there anybody who didn't know that? that the Hezbollah in Lebanon is uh, deployed in villages that the missiles are being launched from schools, from mosques, from civilian uh, establishments, that the same thing was being done by the Hamas in Gaza. Goldstone didn't know that, people didn't know that, that uh, nobody has yet found a more effective way of dealing with that than uh, the Israeli army did. And uh, so in, in that sense, I say I think the facts are crystal clear. The fact that Israel and the supporters of Israel have not been successful in making it crystal clear to everybody, including Mr. Goldstone, I am not really in a position to explain why this is not the case, and I don't think it would have been any different if Israel had participated in the Goldstone inquiry. Last question. Safiarovsky of the Yomi Urishim on the Japanese Daily. I wanted to ask, uh, when you see the stagnation of the talks with the Palestinians, how close we are to a third intifada, to your opinion? Well, uh, predicting the future in, in the Middle East is very, very difficult. And I don't think anybody can really answer that question. In, in, the, in the press, you can probably hear different views on the subject. 
Uh, my impression is from uh, Israeli people who are dealing with, with uh, that issue that it does not, does not seem imminent. Now, uh, again, I think now, now that we have these two separate Palestinian entities, you really have to address the question on two, on two counts. In Gaza, at the moment, it's relatively quiet. Uh, the firing of uh, Qassam uh, rockets against the road and the, the towns in the south, you might just as well call that an intifada, that's using a terror weapon against Israeli civilians. That's what the intifada was all about. They're not doing it at the moment. Now here again, that maybe raises the question of deterrence. <coughs> Some people say, now, you see, the gas-lead operation has restored Israel's deterrence, and now it's quiet. Uh, some people are trying to justify the equality of Israel's response in the Second Lebanon War, saying, I think, uh, the, the, the uh, head of the Northern Command said just recently, we've had the quietest, quietest year in the North that we've had for ever, for, for a very long time. So does that mean that Israel uh, has the turn capability and there will not be a, another another launch of rockets from the south or uh, uh, I'll, I'll talk about the, the Judea Samaria in a minute. Uh, I, I think what has happened here is that uh, whereas the Hamas had reason to believe after three years or more of firing rockets against Zorot and the towns in, in, the, in the south and there not being a substantial Israeli response. That they could continue doing that with impunity. When Israel finally responded in the Kestler operation, I guess they've now come to the conclusion that whereas they thought that maybe they had gotten Israel used to a daily dose of Qassam rockets, that Israel was not prepared to uh, reconcile itself with that kind of situation. So for the time being, they're not doing that. They're amassing more weapons, doesn't mean they've given up their plans, but to continue to the type of operation that existed before Castlet, I don't think that's something they don't want to do. And I think pretty similar, similar situation in the north with the Hezbollah. They also had reason to believe over the years, after the unilateral withdrawal, that they could kidnap Israeli soldiers, that they could launch Katyushat, and that there would all be no substantial response from Israel. Even though, you may remember that David Barak, who uh, carried out the unilateral or withdrawal from Lebanon, said at the time that if there were going to be any provocative actions from Lebanon against Israel, they better beware. The, the, the ground will shake. Some, some of that effect in, in Lebanon. And soldiers were kidnapped, Jews were uh, malanched, and nothing happened, and the Hezbollah had reason to believe that uh, this is something that they continue. Well, after the Second Lebanon War, they saw they, they got a massive Israeli response, regardless of what, what, what people think about the quality of that response. It was a massive Israeli response, and I guess they have reason to think uh, at this time that they might get that again if they were to return to the mode of operation before the Second Lebanon War. In addition, as we know, the, the Hezbollah today has some other interests, in political interests in Lebanon itself. They have to consider what the reaction would be of the people in Lebanon, of the Lebanese government, to which they are a part. So for the moment, things are quiet on, on the northern front, and I think the accent, the accent is uh, for the moment. So I think when we talk about intifada, in fact, we're asking a question about Judea and Samaria, where things are quiet, and they're quiet because of the Israeli response, uh, Humat Magen, the operation uh, Humat Magen, and uh, the presence of Israeli troops in Judea and Samaria, even at the present time. And uh, I think that if the Israeli troops, say, were to withdraw, as I said, I think um, uh, Muhammad, uh, Mahmoud Abbas's reign would be in, in danger, and uh, we could expect, I think, some rockets from, uh, from Judea and Samaria into the cities of, of Israel. Uh, I think, but with the presence of, of Israeli troops there, it's really not very likely that we would get that, that, that kind of a situation because of the presence of Israeli troops. Also, we know that there's been a very significant improvement in economic conditions in Judea and Samaria. So whether that in any way attenuates the desire, the motivation of people to begin another intifada or not, 
for the moment it doesn't look like it's uh, on the horizon. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking uh, Professor Moshe Arantz.